out this morning? No? Brother Dan, do we have any announcements? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Maybe if you think about something, we can come up uh, afterwards. All right. So we are in a new series this morning. Amen. The series is entitled Building Below the Baseline. Building Below the Baseline. And I love this, uh, this lesson that we're getting ready to talk about this morning, a relationship with God. Now, um, you know, I was born and raised a Catholic, and uh, I was always taught and I was always told that I was supposed to have a relationship with the church. I was supposed to have a relationship with the, the priests and the, the Pope, if you will, that I couldn't have a relationship with God. I couldn't have a relationship with the Bible because there were certain things in the Bible that I couldn't understand, so it was wrong for me to study the scriptures on my own. But I tell you, that was, that was so false. And that was so untrue. Amen. And listen, God is a, is a relational God. Amen. You think about a few of the people uh, that uh, walked with God. Think about Joseph for a second. You know, Joseph had a true walk with the Lord. He uh, shunned sin. He ran away from Potiphar's wife. Never complained in Egypt. You think about Abraham. What was Abraham called? The friend of God. Amen. Y'all remember that? Abraham was the friend of God. Isn't that amazing to have, to be called, imagine Carrie's called Carrie, the friend of God. Wow. And, and it wasn't necessarily that Abraham took that title. It was that God had mentioned that about his servant Abraham. How about Moses? You think about Moses for a second. Moses, remember how we said in Exodus, I believe it was 32, 33. He says, Lord, show me thy glory. You know, he wanted to walk with the Lord. The Lord told him, because the children of Israel are sinning, I'm going to send my angel to go with you. And he said, no, Lord, if you don't, I don't want your angel. As much as I'm sure Moses loved the angels and, and uh, wanted them to be with him, he said, no, Lord. He says, if you don't come up hence with us, Lord, help us not to go, uh, take us not up hence, he said. So Moses had that relationship with God. How about the, the apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul loved the Lord oh so much. All the persecutions that he endured. And in fact, we're getting ready to study here Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. The Apostle Paul penned these words down, inspired with the Holy Spirit. He says, he says, that I may know him. What does that mean, that I may know him? I want to know everything about my Savior. I want to have a personal relationship with him. He says, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Uh, and, and listen, these weren't just words. The Apostle Paul didn't just preach this and just he sat back on the, on the bench. The Apostle Paul was in the fight. The Apostle Paul was in the race. Amen. And he says to be made conformable unto his death. Wow. Well, just as Jesus faced the Sanhedrin, they put him up there on the cross. You think about the Apostle Paul faced Emperor Nero, and he was also persecuted for the faith, a martyr, right? He says in verse 11 of Philippians 3, he says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and that as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing that I do, forgetting those things, which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What was the Apostle Paul saying here? He was saying all the things that were in my mind and in my past, all the accolades and all the success and, and all the things that I was taught before, I put them behind me. And all of a sudden, my eyes are upon Christ. My eyes are upon the finish line. My eyes are to stay in this race. Uh, let me give you this introduction here on a relationship with God. Salvation gives us the most wonderful relationship of life. When someone receives Christ as Savior, new life is birthed within. That's what's basically called born again. It, came never, it can never be taken away or lost. It is a relationship that changes our eternity. But it also has the potential to change our immediate lives. Salvation means that we are declared righteous before God. And that's another word to be justified, to be 
to be made righteous before God, just as though I had never sinned. In our court system, a judge will drop a gavel and declare his verdict upon a defendant. Likewise, God is our ultimate judge. When we come before him, we are declared righteous if we are saved. For those who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior for an atonement, God declares us righteous by the merit of his own son's blood. So you imagine that. Imagine a courtroom, God the Father, the ultimate judge, sitting upon the throne. And we stand before the throne, listen, guilty, right? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you think about uh, our, our, the many sins that we have committed, right? If we were to line all those up, I mean, they, my sins would be from here to Australia. I don't know how many sins have I told in my life? How many times have I uh, looked upon a woman with lust? How many times have I disobeyed my parents? How many times have I taken God's name in vain? That's called blasphemy. How many times have I broken the commandments? How many times have I broken God's heart? But praise God that the Bible says, I will remember their sins no more. Listen, you don't have to hold on to remembering the guilt and the shame of your sins anymore. Why? Because when you stand before the judge, the creator God who created us, we have a perfect lawyer, a perfect advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who has never lost a case. Amen? Amen. And he's going to look at God the Father. And all he's going to do is show them the nails there in his hands and in his feet. And he's going to say, this one has accepted me as their as their personal Savior. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. So we can stand before the king, the ultimate judge, and uh, declared innocent, declared not guilty. Amen? Jesus said this in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Particularly in the culture of that day, back when Jesus' time, one would have understood the significance of the agricultural peril. A branch without a vine would soon shrivel up and die. There, we could stop right there and just kind of teach a whole sermon on that. We need to abide in Christ. We need to stay connected to the vine. Amen. Without him, we're going to shrivel up and die. A branch without the vine would soon shrivel up and die. Likewise, without Christ, we have no strength or ability to bear fruit. Now, there's one thing that pleases God. What is it, class? Bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Remember John 15? He says, uh, abide in me and I in you. He says, without me, ye can do nothing. I'm kind of paraphrasing the, uh, the verses here in John 15. You could... Study that out for yourself. But he says, In this is my Father glorified, and this brings glory or honor to my Father if you bear much fruit. So without Him, we cannot bear any fruit. Salvation also makes Christ our cornerstone. The Apostle Paul used this analogy in his letter to the church in Ephesus when he said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. But I love this part here. He says, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You think about that. I don't know how many siblings you have here upon this earth, but I tell you, our spiritual siblings, they're everywhere. Amen. And there's many of them that have gone on before us in heaven. And listen, I can't wait to see some of my brothers and sisters up there and just sit down and talk to Abraham and talk to Moses and talk to Isaac and, and talk to these, you know, wonderful men and women of God, Rahab and all these people who had great faith and just sit down and talk talk to them and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone and whom also the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the lord in whom you also are built together for an habitation of god through the spirit a christian has the advantage of building his life on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, the hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, written by Edward Mote, adequately states, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The amazing thing about many Christian lives is that we have mastered the art of giving the illusion of success, all the while ignoring the foundation that is designed by God to support the structure of our lives, it is impossible to have the appearance of growing in Christ, but have a crumbling foundation. Think about that. How many of us, and if we could just tell on ourselves, we'll hold the Bible, 
We'll look good on the outside. We'll wear our suit or the ladies will wear their dresses. They'll sing unto the Lord. But as soon as we get into the car, we're arguing with our spouse. We're yelling at our children. We go home and, 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 and horrible things are coming out of, our, out of our mouths, negativity and profanity. And we go to work and, and we laugh at the, the worldly jokes with our coworkers. And listen, this, these are facts. Amen. These are facts. This is exactly why we're studying lessons like this that can help equip us to have a stronger and a better relationship with God. You know, you think about Enoch for a second. You know, the, Bible's, the Bible doesn't talk much about Enoch's life, but it does say this, that God loved and was pleased with Enoch. So guess what? He took him. He says, you know what? I, I, think, uh, I think I want you up in heaven with me. Amen. Why? If you study uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, if you will, the chapter of faith, Enoch was in there. Amen. He was in there. That's also, if you kind of think about if you think about pre-tribulation, you know, there's a lot of uh, churches that will teach about a post-tribulation or a mid-tribulation. I believe in what's called a pre-tribulation, meaning that God is going to rapture us out of here and then the tribulation is going to come upon the earth. I don't believe we're going to go through the tribulation. You say, why? Well, if you think about Enoch for a second, God took Enoch up. Enoch was a type of the church, if you will. Not to get off a topic here about the relationship with God. But Enoch was a type of the church. And what happened after God took Enoch? We well, think about the flood. Think about how God looked upon, in Genesis chapter 6, God looked upon the world and he saw the filth and the sickness and the sin of the world. And God said, you know what, this is, this is, I'm puking in my mouth because of this so much sin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flood the earth. And there were only eight souls there that found grace and favor in the sight of God. No one is family. Think about all the people there and all the animals and all the, all the life, if you will, that died during that time. Yep. But God took Enoch. Amen. So what is that? A, kind of sort of a representation of that pre-tribulation. God's wrath was upon the earth at that time, pouring out his wrath with the flood, right? Because of sin. But God took Enoch before that flood as a pre-tribulation wrath. If you think about uh, Thessalonians, the Bible says, For we are not the children of Amen. wrath. Amen. So what's God going to do during the tribulation here for seven years? He's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. Why? Because sin is just rising to the heavens. But thank God, my brothers and sisters, that we don't have to be here during those times. Amen? Amen. Let me give you this illustration of Pisa, Italy. Many of you know about that well-known landmark, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, through the tower... Uh, Though this tower draws tourists from all over the world, it is actually an embarrassment, uh, embarrassing display of the ramifications of a faulty foundation. Construction of the Tower of Visa began in 1173. It was built on soft soil. There's so much we can learn from that. Remember how Christ talked about building our mm -hmm. house upon a rock, amen, not upon soft soil, not upon the sand. It was built in soft soil and was given a foundation that was less than 10 feet deep. That's nothing, right? You need a, a deeper foundation. Even before its completion in 1372, its infamous tilt was noticeable to the naked eye. The inadequate, inadequate foundation was too unstable to support such a large structure. From 1990 to 2001, the tower was closed to the public, while a $25 million project was conducted to stabilize the structure and reduce its lean. Even after 11 years of reconstruction, the lean was only able to be reduced by 16 inches. Millions of people make their way to the Tower of Pisa and gaze with awe at the phenomenon of such a structure. But every day we cross paths with souls whose structures are just as much of a contradiction to functionality as that tower in Italy today. Think about our lives. Are our lives leaning, if you know what I mean? What causes us to lean? Sin, right? Sin. It does not matter how much effort to put into the uh, constructing of a successful life. If we only take care of the outside and do not put effort into the part that, that which means the most, the foundation, the soul, the inner man, our demise will eventually become so obvious to the naked eye. Let me give you one, you're filling the blank one, 
the foundation of a relationship, the foundation of a relationship. For those of you who came in uh, a little bit after 9.30, I apologize if you're hearing in my voice. Um, I feel like I'm getting a little under the weather or allergies or something. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says that I may know him. The apostle Paul was saying, the most important thing that I desire in my Christian walk is that I may know him. Know who? Know Jesus Christ. To walk with him. To talk to him. And the power, I want to know the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. While the apostle Paul pinned these words down, he was not speaking of a casual knowledge of God. Or of simply knowing Jesus as Savior. He was speaking of an intimate and deep walk and knowledge of Almighty God. The Greek word used for know, used in this passage, means to understand, to grasp, or to ascertain. Especially to be familiar or acquainted with a person or a thing. It is to really know Jesus in an abiding, personal relationship. Philippians 3.10 highlights three ways of knowing Jesus. Number one. Or, or A, I should say, is know his person. Know his person. But Dan, thank you so much for that. This kind, this kind of knowledge of Jesus Christ is far more intellectual knowing about Jesus. It is knowing him personally. We have the opportunity to develop a relationship with him. Knowing the person of Jesus Christ means that we spend much time with him. Let me go back to that. Knowing the person of Jesus Christ means that we spend much time with him. Now, let's just park here just for a second. We have a really long study, but I just want to kind of hit at this point. Knowing Jesus requires us spending time with him. Now, we can always know a person by how much time that person spends with the things that they most love. For instance, if I love my spouse and I'm supposed to love my spouse, you're going to see me always wanting to be with my spouse, always wanting to hang out with her. If I love cars, I'm going to always go to car auctions or car shows, or I'm going to always be around cars and, and car parts and working on cars, right? It's going to display who Carlo really is. Now, I've ever met someone that all they want to do, and this reminds me of a perfect person, perfect example, Brother Lupe Duarte. How many of you remember Lupe Duarte? What a man of God he was, amen? Lived a really rough, rough life, but when he got saved, he was all in for the Lord. Brother Lupe Duarte, all he ever wanted to talk about was Jesus. All he ever wanted to talk about was the Bible. All he ever wanted to talk about was heaven and how he couldn't wait to get to heaven. Brother Lupe, how are you doing this morning? Better than I deserve. Better than I deserve. Amen. So, so when I look at Brother Lupe and all he wants to do is talk about Jesus. Remember, Jesus said this. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Amen. Now, when someone's talking about filth all day, that person's a part of the world. You can tell. It's very obvious, very clear. When someone wants to talk about the Bible and talk about Jesus and talk about heaven and talk about holy things, righteous things, mm -hmm. that's a man or a woman of God. Now, I believe this with all my heart that God, remember the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth, right? When God is looking down and he sees a soul like that, I believe Enoch was like that, right? God's going to say, I'm going to put my power upon that soul. I'm going to bless that soul. I'm going to abide with that person because that person wants to walk with me. That person wants to actually know me like the great Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 18, the Apostle Paul said, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, talking about the church in Ephesus, and the love unto all the, and the love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of the inheritance are in the saints. Consider these words by F.B. Meyer. We may know him personally, intimately, face to face. Christ does not live back in the centuries, nor amid the clouds in, of heaven. He is near us, with us, compassing our path and our laying down, and, our, and, equi and he is acquainted in all of our ways. But we cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and the teaching of 
the Holy Spirit. We definitely need the Holy Spirit to manifest who Christ is for us. Amen. Remember what Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Spirit. Holy Spirit. We need the capital S, the capital H Holy Spirit. John Milton accurately stated the end of all learnings is to know God. And out of that knowledge is to love and to imitate him. Let me say that one more time. The end of all learning is to know God. Isn't that what Solomon said, the most wisest man upon the earth? Remember Ecclesiastes, as he finished pinning down all the, the words there in Ecclesiastes, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. That kind of sounds like what John Milton is saying here. The end of all learning. I can only imagine Solomon. You know, that's one person I want to talk to. Solomon, you had all the wisdom in the world. What were you doing, dude? With all the women. With all the things that, that you know, I know you called it all vanity. I know you repented. I do believe, you know, Solomon's in heaven right now. I could only imagine the words of his father, David. You know, if David was alive, he would have probably said, what, what in the world are you doing? Right? But uh, the end of all knowledge, the end of all learning is to know God. And out of that knowledge, to love and to imitate God. Listen, for us uh, married people in here, we know our spouses. Or you should know your spouse, amen? Or else you're going to get a, an elbow in here this morning. Listen, I know what Nor loves. And I know what, what pushes Nor's buttons. And I try not to push those buttons, right? But listen... Do you know what God loves? We know our spouses, right? We know our children. How about this? Our children is another good example. I know exactly what Joseph loves. I know exactly what my little girl's only one, and I already know what she loves, right? And I'm starting to learn a little bit more, just spending every day with them. I'm starting to learn more about their character each and every day. But listen, do you know what blesses your Savior's heart? And let me ask you this, my brothers and sisters. Are you doing that which blesses his heart? And do you know what he dislikes? You know, there's a lot of things that the Lord dislikes. Study the Proverbs, right? The Bible says these seven things does the Lord hate, right? A lying tongue and, and the list goes on there. Shedding of innocent blood, abortion, and whatever. We're not going to go into that list. But there are certain things that breaks God's heart. Are you doing those things? And if so... This is a perfect morning, this morning, that we repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. Help me to be able to do th those things that truly bless your heart. Let me give you B. B, I want you to know his power. Know his power. Philippians 3.10. And the power, the Apostle Paul said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. The Greek word for power, this is pretty cool here, is dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite. I like that. Amen. Dynamite. It is life-changing power. It is a life-changing power that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Amen. That's a tremendous blessing. Let me give you C. C. To know His presence. To know His presence. The Apostles Paul said in Philippians 3.10 again, And the fellowship of His sufferings to be made conformable unto His death. The word fellowship speaks of communion. Communion. Are you having communion with your Savior each and every day? Amen. If not, why not? It means to partake with Christ, to communicate with Him daily. Paul had such a deep abiding relationship with Christ that even as he penned these words down from prison, he had come to realize that the sufferings of life gave him a venue of fellowship with Christ. Even in prison, you think about Philippians 4, 4, as he was pinning the words down to the church in Philippi, as they were, as they were uh, uh, moaning basically for him and saying, oh, Lord, please get him out of prison. He was saying, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Yes, the apostle Paul knew he was going to face Emperor Nero. Yes, he knew he was going to die a martyr, but he still had the positive spirit by saying, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So let me give you two, two. The formation of faith. The formation of faith. Philippians 
3, 11 through 12, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. When a relationship with God begins in an intri intricate, <laughs> I can barely say that word there. Yes, thank you. Cast out my tongue. Part of our foundation, we begin to grow in our faith. Of course, we are saved by faith, but our faith ought not stop our salvation. That is just the beginning. As our relationship deepens and we know the Lord more intimately, our confidence in Him will likewise grow. Let me give you this illustration. We get excited at the announcement of a newborn. Ladies in particular like to know the details. How much did the baby weigh? How long was the baby? We want to know, we want to see pictures and share our uh, admiration of this new life. But six months down the road, there's a problem if that baby still looks the same, weighs the same, and it's just helpless and needy as a newborn. We would be concerned. That is not natural. That's not normal. It goes against the cycle of, of a maturing life. Our faith ought to likewise develop. Salvation, being born again, is an exciting moment. But we should not stay in an infant type of stage. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. Listen, amen. we should grow. Amen. We should always grow. Listen, didn't the Apostle Paul pin the words down best how he said, Listen, I want to give you meat, but you're still on the milk. Right? You're still, you're still acting like newborn babes. We should be the ones who are teaching others. But mm. now we're still, we're still in this process of infantry. We're still drinking on milk, right? The Apostle Paul was saying you, you need to grow up. The, uh, let me give you A, A, the promise of resurrection. The promise of resurrection. At salvation, a believer experiences a spiritual resurrection. Our spirit being dead in our trespasses and sins is made alive through the new life that comes to live within us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 5, and 6 says, And you have be quickened to be made alive, basically is what that word means, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, for by grace are you saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. To be quickened means to be made alive. Galatians Chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, pay attention to this part, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul pinned the words down and said, You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? The Lord's. Listen, we are no longer our own. The Apostle Paul knew that perfectly. That's exactly why he was okay to die a martyr for Jesus Christ. You know what he said in Galatians? Uh, he says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He says, he says, you want to know my faith? Let me just take my clothes off and show you. I mean, that kind of sounds a little bit weird. But let me take my shirt off and show you the stripes on my back. Let me show you the persecutions. Let me show you the shipwreck. Let me show you, let me show you my feet, how many miles I've walked the callus on my feet because I just wanted to go and just share Jesus with another soul. I just wanted to go and just strengthen the church in Ephesus, to strengthen the church in Philippi. I just wanted to go and plant a church in Colossae. I just wanted to, to, to be able to bring on more preachers and more teachers and to be able to grow the kingdom of God more and more. You, you see the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul as he was pinning all these words down? A, again, the promise of resurrection. Let me give you B, the process of transformation. The process of transformation. To have attained, as used in these verses, means to come to, to have arrived. This is not Paul bragging over his status with Christ, but it's rather a statement of his humility. He recognized that he had not arrived, actually, nor was he perfect. A Christian's transformation does not happen all at once. It takes place over the course of a lifetime. It is, it is aspiring to be more and more like the image of Christ each and every day. Let me give you this illustration. Consider the transformation of those who enlist in the military. A young man leaves his home. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. A young man leaves home with his own likes and styles and generally with more uh, of an hint like a teenager. 
a maturity, uh, and an attitude. But as he returns home several weeks later after boot camp, he's completely a transformed person. He walks with confidence and a rhythm in his step. He speaks with clarity and respect. He looks at you in your eyes as, he, as you speak to him. And above all, he's proud to wear his new uniform. I think Paul knows about this uh, greatly. Amen? A little, How, a little bit. All right. <laughs> How did the transformation take place? Even, even as being a police officer, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Uh, in part, because he has been in an environment or structure where obedience and respect were demanded. His environment has rubbed off on him. If we spend time with the Lord in God's word and with godly people, Christ's likeness will begin to transform inside of us and to reflect and to show our lives unto those who are watching us. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed unto the image of his son. That's the main goal. Amen. Christ is wanting to mold us and shape us to conform us unto his own image. And that's the whole reason why we're called Christians. The first six letters there in Christian is what? Christ. Christ. So we are to be a little Christ walking upon this earth. A follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, that word Christian is used so loosely these days. Even in America. Amen. Unfortunately. But listen, if we are truly a Christian, someone who's following the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to be conformed unto the image of Him. Let me give you three, three, the fill in the blank, three, the fixation of will. The fixation of will. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. From these verses, we see Paul's overwhelming determination to finish strong. How are you doing in your Christian race this morning? Amen. The Apostle Paul, or actually in the book of Hebrews, it tells us to, to take off that weight. Amen. All the excess baggage, if you will, all the sin and all the things that easily beset us. And run our course, amen, with faith and with strength. Let me give you A under 3A, Paul's recognition, of, I'm sorry, Paul recognized his position. Paul recognized his position. He says, I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul was not complacent with the level of spiritual growth that he had already reached. Though he would already be considered a great man of God, he wanted to constantly draw near to Christ. Paul knew that he had to keep growing each and every day as a Christian. <clears throat> Let me give you B. Paul rejected the past. Paul rejected the past. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul had a past of which any Christian would be ashamed of. What kind of past was that? He was a martyr. Remember, he used to drag Christians out of, out of the houses, out of the churches, if you will, and persecute them. Amen. Take them to jail. Apprehend them. He had been responsible for actively persecuting Christians putting to death innocent people. If anyone had a reason to hang his head in hopelessness, it could have been the Apostle Paul. But Paul wisely chose to forget those things that were behind him. I think Paul was hanging on to those verses of how the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will remember their sins no more. I have wiped away their sins as far as the east is to the west. Amen. Thank God for verses like that that we can hang on to. Um, listen, all of us got a pass in here. Yep. Amen. Some more than others. You know, maybe maybe there's some of us in here that have maybe taken someone's life, maybe spent time in prison. I don't know any of your testimonies or, or history or background, and some of you don't know mine. But listen, I'll tell you this. Thank God that it's all covered under the blood. Amen. Thank you. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't see us for who we were. He sees us for who we are. Praise God. We are born again Christians in Christ. Let me give you C, Paul ran to win the prize. Paul ran to win the prize. That should be our goal, amen? I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, he says. Press towards means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. Paul had a goal in view, something toward which he ran swiftly, eliminating any possible distractions 
that prize was attaining Christ Jesus, it was knowing Christ. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Conclusion. At the conclusion of Paul's life, he could say that he had been faithful unto the end. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, as he pinned these words down to a young pastor, Timothy, he says this, for I, have now, uh, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure, Timothy, is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Are those words, if Jesus were to come back tonight, if Jesus were to require your soul tonight, are these words that you can, you can say confidently, Lord, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. This is the declaration of a man who built well below the baseline. He had a solid foundation of a growing relationship with Christ. His faith had taken form and strengthened over the years of his Christian walk. And he had fixed his will on the prize of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Below the baseline is of the utmost of importance to the structure of the Christian life. Even if it looks well on the outside, it is a foundation that ultimately determines the success of our Christian walk. Mm -hmm. Lesson one, a relationship mm -hmm. with God. A relationship nice. with God. Brother Dan. Yeah. Amen. That was so good.